Good morning to the online Joel Classroom team. Today is the fifth day of faculty development program organized by Alazar Law College, Rodogul. First of all, I am privileged to welcome all of you to the first session of faculty development program on the topic Contemporary Challenges to Legal Education. I am honored and feel privileged to welcome our respected resource person, Dr. Anil Amayas. He is currently the Associate Professor, National University of Advanced Legal Studies. After obtaining his BAL LLB from Mahatma Gandhi University, he did his LLM from Cochin University of Science and Technology with specialization in human rights, commercial law, and jurisprudence. He took the LLM examination of Cochin University and was also the recipient of Dr. A.T. Marcos Memorial Gold Medal, the K.C. Menon Memorial Endowment, and V.N. Patmanabha Pillai Memorial Prize. He, is, he did his doctoral studies at Cochin University of Science and Technology on equitable access to education in India, titled as Assessing Education Legal Perspectives. He also taught law at School of Legal Studies at Cochin University and also at Government Law College at Marku. He has also practiced at High Court of Kerala. We most respectfully welcome you, sir, for this session. Thank you, Kiran. May I start? Yes, sir. Okay, let me, before I go into the PPT, let me just uh, thank the organizers. Lovely ma'am taught me criminal procedure code. And I'm really happy that uh, this uh, kind of initiatives is coming from the Alasa Law College. I, I remember being here uh, in the previous uh, year also. I think that my, my session was scheduled for 28 then. 28th of May. So the consistency with respect to conducting these programs and this time taking it to an international audience and uh, international uh, uh, faculty coming in, uh, it's a good sign, especially in the context of uh, a lot of issues with respect to legal education. And those challenges are what we will be looking at. Uh, I thank uh, Hint for uh, inviting me and uh, all uh, uh, members of al College for creating that WhatsApp group, for updating it, and uh, all the previous uh, uh, presenters also uh, who have very thoughtfully you know, given those uh, slides, which gives an idea with respect to how this is uh, turning out. And uh, it's very informative in that sense. So thank you all uh, for uh, inviting me and uh, making this uh, uh, even possible. Now, for today's uh, session, I would uh, uh, one of the one of the challenges that uh, I have identified is the aspect of uh, lectures. So, I would love to make it a conversation if it is possible. Uh, but I have a few slides which will highlight some of those issues which uh, uh, probably requires a little bit more attention from us, and then. Uh, uh, I would welcome uh, the participant sharing because all of you are actually in the profession and uh, face this on a day-to-day -day basis, these challenges. So if you can share your experiences also, then it'd be wonderful. I have a small presentation ready. I'll just uh, share my screen with respect to that. I hope it is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Maybe just tweak my screen so that I have uh, access to both the presentation as well as the audience. Okay. So this is a session structure that I intend to look into. One, we need to have a real clear picture with respect to the importance of legal education and uh, what is it that we try to achieve so that we can actually look into the challenges. Then uh, we have this regulatory framework, which of late has uh, thrown up some challenges. So we'll have to have a look at that also. And then of course, the contemporary challenges uh, is not uh, really 
uh, confined to legal education, education in general, plus, of course, those that are specific to legal education. And then we have this uh, possibility of exploring solutions. So this is the session structure, and I'll try to uh, wind it all up within the time allotted. Just say that. Okay, so these are identified as the major uh, uh, reasons. These are uh, not copied from elsewhere. So these are something that I find to be worth looking into. So in the first instance, of course, uh, legal education ultimately is in the context of uh, creation of legislation and then uh, uh, the remaining paraphernalia follows only the creation of the legislation as such. So legislation is an essential function of the modern state and uh, uh, it's a reflection of uh, democracy that uh, that's the people's will that get reflected in the legislative process and the ultimate legislation and acceptance and the legal, uh, uh, the, the obligation, once it is felt by the people, then it is easier for the people to actually respond to the law without needing a, a coercive uh, kind of an atmosphere to, to get in the legislation enforced. So legislation as an essential uh, function of the modern state uh, demands that there has to be legal education. And uh, I have just broken it up into multiple aspects of it. One of the major issues when uh, we talk about legislation is uh, the requirement for clarity. So language, as you know, in India, it's a, a major problem because we have multiple languages and uh, English, though is a lingua franca, you know, that's a French term, but uh, uh, though English is a linking language and especially in the context of the courts where the dispute resolution actually happened, especially the constitutional courts, you'll find that uh, English is a major uh, uh, uniting force, but we have states also given the freedom to allow for even high courts uh, can allow for, and some high courts have actually done that, uh, can allow for uh, use of Hindi also as a medium. Uh, but you have issues with respect to converting the thought process, the Indian thought process, as where the mother tongue is different into an English language legislation, which takes uh, or every, every language has its limitation that it is closely associated with that particular culture. So how to associate our requirements into the language. And for that, there's a real uh, uh, challenge with respect to the way we impart legal education, the way the legislations get drafted is just a reflection of that uh, particular process. So clarity in legislation minimizes disputes and consequently taps efficiency of the economy and political of the nation. And this clarity in legislation is something that we have not really achieved in the, uh, if you look at it, the recent uh, uh, series of legislations and the tweaks, especially, you know, look at uh, insolvency and uh, bankruptcy code, for example, to the, uh, one of the later legislations of 2016, you'll find that uh, it had to be constantly tweaked. And uh, even now, they are thinking of amending the uh, code. It was supposed to be a code. It was long. Uh, it took a long time to fructify, and you still have problems with respect to the aspect of it. So it shows that uh, legislative clarity 
is not really something that we have been able to achieve. And that is a serious issue and it reflects the legal education that uh, or the fundamentals because most of the persons who were working on it were all lawyers uh, educated in India. And even you no, know, even if you are talking about education outside India, it's just for one pay, one hour, one year of uh, LLM is not going to change things. So the fundamentals remain with the LLB, and that LLB requires some uh, or or a better attempt uh, to translate the thought processes, the ideas into the language. And with, there is a serious uh, lack of skill set with respect to that. Then we have uh, this issue of. Uh, trained legal personnel needed for the drafting part. It is not just in relation to the legislation, but it is also in relation to contracts because the essential, the economic engine runs on contracts. And uh, if uh, contracts are not uh, drafted well, then that becomes a sure recipe for uh, uh, disputes. And uh, then the drafting of petitions. If a poorly drafted petition comes up before the court, then uh, again, it doesn't make any sense. It requires a lot of time to be spent on arguing what exactly is written in the petition. So in, in multiple stages, we require uh, proper legal education to minimize disputes. And minimizing disputes enhances uh, uh, economic efficiency because there is no and that that uh, amount saved can be used for better purposes. So for the polity at large, it is required that uh, legal education must be of uh, better standards so that everybody benefits, not just the lawyers, but also the general public in India. Now, having said that, there are other aspects also, especially the if, if you look at the number of uh, lawyers in the country vis-a-vis -vis the population, we are supposed to have the second largest uh, uh, trained legal, the number of trained legal personnel in the world is in India. First, of course, is in the US. So even that, with vis-a-vis -vis our population, that is not really significant number at all. And uh, I'm not talking about uh, the... The, the advocate community as such, the lawyers who are actually practicing, I'm talking about general awareness of law. So there is a disproportionate number. Fortunately, there's a disproportionate number of uh, uh, lawyers uh, or co legally qualified persons in politics. But unfortunately, the quality of uh, discourse in the political sphere reflects uh, uh, the lack of uh, uh, quality education or quality legal education, because most of the dis uh, discourses seem to be ill-informed with respect to what the law is, what the proper interpretation ought to be. And uh, the, uh, the, there is another aspect of uh, conducting the debate also. So it, it's, a, it's a cacophony of voices rather than a proper debate that happens in the political sphere. And when it, is, when it involves uh, legally, supposed to be legally trained persons, supposed to be lawyers, uh, it uh, speaks of... Uh, uh, very much, you know, very loudly with respect to the problem. So this is an area, again, for the purpose of uh, better democratic governance, it's an, it's an area that uh, requires to be addressed. And then uh, generally aware public, the legal awareness of public will only be enhanced if legal education, not just, uh, the, no, not just uh, uh, the way we try to provide legal education in the, in the form of LLB and uh, LLM, which are the most common degrees, uh, but also other uh, formats are required because uh, there is a requirement for learning the law, not just for practicing uh, as a lawyer, but also for all other uh, purposes which moves the economy. So government servants, government is the largest litigant. Government servants need to know, have a better awareness about law, but these are not provided. These are only provided as in-house uh, kind of training programs which do not really cater to the need con uh, considering the, 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 the number of legislations involved, the number of subordinate legislations involved especially, uh, the rules, uh, the interpretations given by different courts. So you have a huge volume of legal materials which do not really get reflected in the courses that are offered. That is one problem. And uh, the needs of uh, 
the public vis-a-vis -vis legal information, legal knowledge is not catered to by the kind of degrees that we supply. So there is a, of course, some of the institutions provide for this MBL, the Master of Business Laws kind of a, a program. Uh, but uh, there are problems with respect to what is being imparted and the way, the, nat the nature of uh, imparting that legal that uh, that kind of uh, legal education. So it, most often it is seen only as a, a milch cow where uh, the students pay fee. Very few classes are conducted uh, where this uh, actual learning process can take place. And most often it is uh, something very similar to a, um, a correspondence kind of a education, which is not what legal education ought to be. And I'll have my reasons. I'll uh, explain why it is uh, not desirable as we go forward. Then uh, this is something that uh, the seventh point is something that I had uh, mentioned uh, uh, cursorily earlier. An informed public will be better to manage as compared to an uninformed mob. So once we realize why a law is there, why that law is important for our own well-being. It's better for us to comply with the requirement as compared to an uninformed person. So the lawyer and the lay person, it's always easy for the state to actually get things done when people know about the law, the why of the law, and where do they stand vis-a-vis -vis the benefits that uh, uh, ought to accrue by the creation of a legal framework. That is one aspect. Second is that uh, we are a democracy and all legislations are supposed to be aimed at preserving the democratic space, the freedom of the individual as against the high-handedness of the state. But the way we are now evolving, if you look at uh, the way it has evolved post-independence, you'll find that uh, State has increasingly usurped the space, the free space that was earlier available for the individual. So from that perspective, legal education becomes important to preserve the liberty of the individual vis-a-vis -vis the increased uh, intrusions into that liberty by the state. So this is something that uh, the, the way we impart legal education currently does not really address, though if it is kept in mind, there is nothing under the current uh, legal framework which can, which will prevent its uh, 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 th that part of it being taught also. But there are some limitations with respect to the ability of a teacher to impart that kind of a, a, uh, education given the current structural uh, frameworks, and that is something that I'll come I'll come back to. Then uh, one of the major uh, uh, problems that we face is this aspect of uh, legally trained personnel, uh, well-equipped legal persons to help us with respect to negotiation of treaties. And uh, we are living, whether we like it or not, we are living in a uh, globalized world. And though there are backlashes these days, in the past few years against uh, globalization because the pain associated with globalization has uh, uh, been uh, uh, early. It was only felt by the LDCs and the developing economies, but uh, now it is being felt by the developed world and there is a resistance with respect to uh, that particular aspect, the pain in the developed world. That is why we see it more, more visibly on the visual media. Um, the plight of uh, the Africans or Indians was not uh, uh, something that was worthy of debate earlier. Even now it is not uh, debated, but when it comes to the white uh, man's burden, then there is more visibility for that and uh, joblessness on account of globalization in the developed world and the consequent uh, civil unrest, the political unrest in those countries has uh, raised questions which were earlier also existing, but which were never raised vis-a-vis -vis the benefits of globalization. I'm not saying that globalization is bad. Okay, It's not uh, that what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that it's a, uh, it's a field where we require more trained legal personnel who are aware about India's needs, who are able to articulate India's needs, who are able to formulate treaty terms which will uh, beneficially, uh, which may be you know, in, in a futuristic manner, which may be uh, 
placed in treaties, strategically positioned in treaties so that we get to gain advantage when there is an international treaty, which India becomes a party to. And for this, there is a huge problem vis-a-vis -vis India is concerned. And of course, this is a problem which is faced not just uh, by us, but also by most of the countries in the developing world. So when, uh, uh, I'll give you one example. When uh, US comes to the negotiating table, they have an army of around 600, 700 lawyers backing up each of their arguments, each word they want to be entered into a treaty provision while we go with one or two or three people. So our ability to take care of our interests, especially in the international arena, is also dependent upon the number of trained legal persons available in India. And uh, it is not just uh, the IPC or the CRPC or the CPC that matters there. It is economic laws, economic legislations, the the, the, that is what actually determines the content that is going to be available with uh, within the constitutional scheme. So the preserving the policy space available to the uh, Indian governments, Indian public, vis-a-vis -vis our commitments and, under the international legal uh, regimes, under the treaty regimes, is something that we need to really seriously focus on. And none of our LLB programs really have that kind of... Uh, uh, a world vision or that kind of a uh, subject. Uh, uh, there is no subject like that being offered, which provides uh, uh, an input. So this is an area which, again, it shows the importance of legal education, shows the challenges that we right currently uh, face vis-a-vis -vis the uh, this field. Then uh, to sum it up in relation to the importance of legal education, I'll just take you to the uh, Law Commission of India report, uh, 66th report on regulation of legal profession. It was submitted in 2017. Well, one of the laments was that uh, the earlier Law Commission reports and the suggestions were never put to, um, were never implemented. So even now, these are also not uh, implemented uh, uh, the way it ought to be. Uh, the problem is that uh, as years goes by, the problems keep on mounting and uh, it's just like you know, the stitch in time will save nine. So when law commission recommends something that is to take care of the legal education sector, the earlier it is implemented, the better we will be as a country, as a nation, as a, a generation of lawyers. So these are areas that are not uh, uh, implemented, though these are actually areas which are already identified and placed in the public domain. So it is not as if uh, uh, we lack awareness about these things. It's just that there is an apathy which uh, promotes the continuation of these kinds of problems. Then uh, in this report, in this report, uh, I think it is page 34 of the report which provides this particular ob uh, observation. So Legal education should also prepare professionals equipped to meet the new challenges and dimensions of internationalization, where the nature and organization of law and legal practice are undergoing a paradigm shift. Further, there is need for original and path-breaking legal research to create new legal knowledge and ideas that will help meet these challenges in a matter in a manner responsive to the needs of the country and the ideals and goals of our constitution. So this is something that uh, is uh, really a, a, a challenge that has been identified and it is something that uh, legal education ought to address and this is something that uh, we are very far from achieving. And then uh, we have the Bar Council uh, coming up uh, with a draft of uh, legal education rules in 2019 which was intended to replace the 2008 rules. Uh, and uh, some of the, uh, the, there are four specific reasons mentioned by the 2019 draft rules uh, as to justify the need for a change. So these are all contemporary challenges that the Indian legal education sector uh, faces as per the Bar Council's viewpoint. So uh, I'm not saying that that is the only viewpoint that is available. What I'm saying is that as uh, leaders or the, the body, professional body managing the profession. Uh, these are some of the 
issues that they have uh, identified to bring in a change, a shift from uh, the earlier uh, rules governing education. And 2008 rules was also something that was uh, revolutionary in so far as uh, uh, some changes were introduced. But it's not, no, often people say that it is not the lack of law uh, that is a problem for India, but the implementation part of it, and it holds true over here also. And these are the things that has been identified. So the rules are framed for promoting and coordinating legal education, leading to grant of professional LLB degree for the following reasons. These are the reasons uh, uh, for the purpose of bringing in the draft rules 2019. And they remain as a draft rule that has not been uh, notified in the gazette yet. And there is, of course, a challenge in relation to the uh, LLM program and uh, the before the Supreme Court where there is a stay granted, but uh, no further uh, uh, active or activity has happened with respect to that. So the rapid global integration of legal regulations for trade, commerce, and industries and technological innovations in global economy. This is a major problem. So the Bar Council envisages the creation of legal or trained legal manpower to deal with this particular aspect. And uh, there is, uh, uh, we have, you know, with the WTO coming into force with the WTO, we have, uh, uh, we are seriously uh, interested in exporting legal services also as part of our service industry. But reciprocity becoming uh, or being the fundamental in relation to the, the way uh, states regulate uh, uh, under the uh, are regulated under the WTO framework. We need to offer this. So, if we want to access others' uh, uh, markets, then we need to open up our markets for the, uh, the, the trained legal personnel from outside also. And we have uh, currently. Uh, I'll come to that. I have mentioned that also in the uh, slides. So we have a new set of rules for facilitating that. So integration of legal regulations for trade, commerce, and industries and technological innovations in the global economy. So world is changing. Technology is driving that change. There is an integration of services. And just like this uh, webinar, it is now easy for uh, people to come together in the virtual platform, sharing ideas. And uh, legal services from the best in the world would be available to the people in India. So why should uh, uh, why shouldn't that be facilitated? And how do we really prepare our uh, uh, new generation of lawyers to deal with that kind of competition? So that is uh, uh, a major trust area. Second is that uh, there is a need for national laws to be more sensitive to the international human rights legal principles. So we are part of that uh, committee of civilized nations. And civilized nations implies that there is a shared uh, standard. And whether we like it or not, we can't uh, uh, keep away saying that India has a unique culture or unique uh, uh, religious philosophy or anything of that kind uh, when the world accepts, especially the Western world, accepts a particular kind of um, uh, legal uh, net, uh, le a, a principled approach to human rights, protection of uh, human rights through the uh, soft law and then now the hard law philosophies. So our legislation must not only be synchronous with what the Western world uh, uh, have already committed to, but we should also be in a position to infuse our philosophy, our recognition of what human rights ought to be into those global standards. So it's a two-way street and uh, our ability to influence what exactly ought to be a legal human rights uh, legal standard will also be, uh, it becomes less painful if we are able to accept and assimilate the human rights principles uh, that are laid down by the world. And in this particular context, we have issues vis-a-vis -vis how the Legislature often is not uh, really sensitive enough to come out with uh, uh, advanced or modern legislations. Then it often it becomes uh, uh, the, the mandate or it's a secondary mandate, in fact, because the pri primary duty is for the legislature to 
step in. So we have uh, uh, piecemeal attempts through the court interventions to provide for those gaps uh, vis-a-vis incorporating the human rights legal principles. And you, you'll, you'll see that uh, this previous week has seen uh, uh, legislations, uh, no, effectively what ought to be legislations getting debated in the Supreme Court. I'm talking about the LGBTQ uh, I plus rights uh, uh, being debated over there. And the court has reserved uh, uh, its judgment. So essentially, legislative area, which has uh, not taken off. And so the debate comes into the, the court's uh, domain. And uh, it requires huge amount of input, uh, informed debate within the country. And for that, uh, uh, who else is better, ought to be better equipped than the uh, law students? So legal education in that sense also is something that uh, we need to be really uh, consciously imparting. Then uh, necessity of emphasis on clinical skill training, both in courtroom litigation management and in alternate dispute resolution mechanisms for the professional legal education in the interest of speedy delivery of justice. Now, uh, the, the ideas are uh, exalted kind of things, but uh, the implementation part of it, especially the woeful lack of uh, empirical data and empirical training uh, that is uh, available to students in the current legal education framework. It's a major challenge. Uh, and this contributes towards that uh, uh, often identified a dichotomy because, between practice of law and the theoretical uh, studies that happen in the uh, education institution. So this is a major area, the clinical skills uh, being imparted as part of the uh, legal education framework. So uh, it's a challenge. I have uh, some solutions also with respect to that. And there are other areas also, connected areas, which needs to be addressed. Then uh, another uh, reason cited is the need for emphasis on super specializations in various branches of law to upgrade the curricula owing to latest developments and to achieve uh, optimum efficiency. So it's an accepted fact that the law has become very complex. It's uh, uh, approach to a lot of things. And uh, that makes it humanly impossible for one person to handle all branches of law or all uh, nuances of litigation. Though we see uh, senior, senior advocates, uh, especially in the Supreme Court, arguing for all kinds of uh, uh, legal causes, but it requires uh, trained people to actually uh, instruct the senior designated seniors for those arguments. So there is a requirement for super specializations and there is a requirement for the, uh, the legal uh, degrees to accommodate this need for super specializations. So Bar Council, for example, for its uh, um, honors program insists only for 36 subjects to be uh, compulsorily imparted. So most uh, institutions provide for around uh, 60 subjects uh, for an honors program and uh, the remaining are what a student ought to be able to pick and choose for the purpose of super specialization. But due to our uh, inability to adapt to the, the, the changes of times, we have not been, most uh, universities have not been able to incorporate that flexibility into the curricula, into the syllabus, into the evaluation, uh, methodologies also. So these are all challenges. We'll come to that. Uh, so these are the major reasons of, of, for uh, providing some importance to legal education in India. And these are the reasons why we need to uh, be seriously looking into these aspects. Now, uh, there are uh, major regulators vis-a-vis -vis the education sphere in the context of legal education. You have the University Grants Commission uh, and you have the Bar Council of India and you have a stated policy under the NEP framework which does not really, in, uh, what do you call, uh, envisage a role for the UGC anymore. But it has not been implemented. So we have a situation where there are competing interests and, compete, and, and there is an uncertainty on account of this. So UGC lays down the broad guidelines vis-a-vis -vis 
the university stream uh, or you, the universities to provide for uh, award of degrees. So recognition of a degree, the nomenclature associated with that, the minimum standards required for educational institutions to function, the minimum qualifications uh, required for the legal, for teachers in general. These are all areas uh, which are recognized to be within the UGC framework. But there is some problems because UGC framework is something that though it is operative in the tertiary education sector, the higher the, the the uh, tertiary education and and to a certain extent to the professional education sector, the there is no mechanism as it stands now, which is a major challenge. We shall be delineating the domains. So you have the AICT and the UGC laying down norms. You have the bar council, the medical council, etc., the dental council or the nursing council laying down norms and uh, there are it, it, it throws some challenges the, the regulatory framework. One is that UGC is envisaged as uh, uh, a fund donation body or a fund sourcing body for the purpose of improving quality of education generally, tertiary education specifically. And you find that uh, the current philosophy is for the UGC not to, or it's, 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 you see a withdrawal of the UGC from the from these sectors in the context of uh, uh, providing funds. And it's a government policy. So it's a consequence of the government policy where the government really wants uh, uh, self-sustaining educational systems or edu educational institutions to be created. Now, uh, education as a public good and education as a private good. So there is a clash between clash of ideologies between identifying this. It affects legal education because legal education is something that ought always to remain in the public good segment, especially because it is like we discussed earlier, it is part of the nation building process. And if it is left to the market forces to determine what ought to be taught or what ought, what will be viable, what is economically more viable, then we are going to face some serious issues with uh, uh, legal aid as a as a major component. We uh, saw what legal education or where legal education ought to be directed at and the, where the public good part of it comes from. So that gray area is seriously there. Second is that uh, Bar Council is a professional education body and uh, legal education is not necessarily restricted to the professional area. You'll find for, I'll give you an example in vis -vis how I perceive it. There were around uh, 84 students in my LLB class that happened around two decades ago. So of that, Hardly 10 are actually litigation lawyers. And of uh, around uh, 76 or 77 people who are still alive, the pandemic took a huge toll, but even otherwise. So you, you'll find that around one seventh are the ones who are actually litigation lawyers. So what is the need for a bar council's uh, and all of them, all of them, uh, mind you, all of uh, uh, all of uh, my classmates are actively in the profession, not practicing as lawyers, but employed in areas where law is a necessity. So that means that there was no requirement for bar council to actually regulate the LLB stream where they studied. What was required? was only for Bar Council as a professional body of uh, regulating legal profession, was to ensure that the standards are met. And a space provided for all those persons who 
wanted education in the legal sphere who did not want to practice, but that was not available. And that is still now, now not available because the number of education institutions who uh, catered to this particular demand is very low. Now, I, I'll put it in another way. The current uh, regime uh, is uh, in relation to the uh, conduct through the Bar Council of re or recognition of uh, a Bar Council's uh, three-year or five-year uh, program where they, did, they, they lay down a minimum uh, legal standard or standard vis-a-vis -vis the curricula, but the actual curricula is left to the universities to determine. All that is required is that uh, the titles of the subjects are actually uh, there with the minimum content, especially the model uh, programs that they provide, the Bar Council provides. As far as possible, the universities follow the same content so that there is no dispute for the, uh, the law college that is actually providing the education uh, uh, on the ground. The, this uh, three-year program was supposed to be chucked out in perhaps the uh, early 80s when the five-year program was introduced. I think I, uh, it was in 83 that uh, the five-year program was proposed as a replacement for the three-year program. And we still see the three-year program, which shows how important the three-year program is at the end of the day. Then uh, you have a, a situation where a five-year program has uh, persons coming in right after school, of course, with uh, uh, most often fighting a very competitive uh, 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 selection process where most people do not really get through. But it still remains uh, an area where you have uh, school students coming in to study law, where law is essentially envisaged as a postgraduate not a postgraduate degree, but a degree that is available only after you have a bare minimum graduate degree. So in that sense, you know, even the integrated program, it's five-year program, it's an integrated program where it is envisaged that a person is qualified to get a degree first before they get the LLB degree. Uh, it requires a certain level of maturity and experience to understand law. And that is not really available the way the current uh, program is set. And uh, the three-year program was uh, originally uh, was created in the 60s by integrating, integrating a, a training program to the earlier existing two-year program. So the training part of it was supposed to be part of the three-year program. The Bar Council, the professional body, did not find that three-year program to be adequately addressing the needs of the time, and they brought in an integrated five-year program, integration, taking away one year of study from the three-year degree and another three-year for LLB. Integration you know, allowed for compressing the entire thing into the five-year program, with training also as part of the built-in process. They found that the training imparted under the five-year program or even under the three-year program to be not good enough. They created the new structure, the Bar Council of India training rules, which was subsequently, you know, in the, the challenge came from Kerala, which succeeded in the Supreme Court. And uh, the, the training part of it was uh, chucked away. And then the Bar Council brought in the All India Bar exam for registration. Uh, the, the, the quality of legal education uh, was proved in the first uh, bar exam where around 75% only got through, 25% failed that exam where the bar council's uh, book for uh, from where the entire questions were sourced was allowed to be taken in and in spite of that, people failed. So you can imagine the kind of uh, uh, legal education that is actually available in the country. And uh, I don't think that has changed much because uh, now, there is no radical change vis-a-vis -vis the delivery, vis-a-vis -vis the institutions, vis-a-vis -vis the people who uh, come for the profession. So practically nothing uh, would have changed, though I don't have any data vis-a-vis -vis the current uh, past percentages and the structure as such. Though the content, the quality of questions have gone up a notch. But still, it's not something that uh, uh, we can proudly uh, show to others, to the outside world as such. Then uh, there is this problem with respect to the one-year programs. Again, there's a regulatory issue. 
UGC allows for a one-year LLM program. Bar Council in its latest avatar, the rules uh, uh, does not allow for it. And uh, Bar Council tries to uh, impose its uh, hegemony on professional legal education by insisting that persons who are not qualified uh, through the one-year program will be appointed. So uh, what they have stated is that if it's a one-year LLM program as a basic qualifying degree, then the person cannot be appointed to a law college and uh, the recognition of the law college will be in question. So that is how they try to impose uh, their uh, uh, hegemony on legal education, professional legal education. There is another aspect uh, of uh, uh, us as a nation wanting to compete with uh, the degrees and the education structures in other countries, especially the West. And that has brought in the NEP, which envisages a four-year program. Of course, it is not necessarily for a professional program, but a four-year degree program, which allows for a PhD to come, come uh, immediately after the four-year uh, program. So we, we have a, a situation of flux, of uncertainty and uh, clarity. Probably time will uh, uh, and experimentation with this will finally result in a in a proper uh, program, uh, a structure, a uniform pattern, so which does not call for uh, different. You know, each student coming out of these in, the, these different programs finds it difficult to go for advanced uh, studies because uh, there of lack of uh, uh, a proper standard. So that's an area that is uh, still uh, uh, not resolved to the full satisfaction of all the stakeholders. Then, of course, we have this uh, rules, uh, the latest uh, rules uh, for uh, foreign qualified lawyers to practice in India, which uh, opens up competition, but uh, through uh, uh, ingenious, uh, uh, what do you call, obstruction making powers of Bar Council, they have restricted the ability of foreign lawyers uh, to actually go before the courts and argue. But uh, these are things that are subject matter of our guards. Uh, commitments, GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services commitments. And uh, uh, though Bar Council is empowered as per our law, if somebody takes it up as a challenge, if some other country takes it up as a challenge uh, and they want to really price open our sector, then these are areas, these are these rules are very, very fragile in nature, the way that it is drafted to withstand scrutiny of international community. So I'm not very sure with respect to the ability to keep out foreign lawyers from Indian courts. Uh, and uh, that ability, uh, especially when we have a need to get uh, our lawyers to practice in those courts. So, and this is not just confined to the legal profession. You have the same situation vis-a-vis -vis the chartered accountants uh, also. So there is a tough war again. People who uh, fear competition, who are uh, not up to the quality or international standards or expectations of international standards might be objective. But there is, so that is in relation to the professional sphere where there is a, a competition or a conflict of interest between the persons who are practicing the profession and uh, the international uh, arena. But we have genuine political reasons also to keep out uh, foreign lawyers, which stems from uh, our uh, need as a sovereign to preserve our sovereign space, our, our uh, 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 policy uh, space for the purpose of ensuring the protection of our interests. Uh, the Western thinking process that is part of our legal education, uh, especially the insistence on uh, in English as the medium for teaching law, that was the, the, the previous thinking that is now giving way to encouraging legal education to be taught in regional languages, which I don't know how uh, well we will be in a position to adopt, especially the national university structures from where I come from, where the, lang the, uh, the common language is better to be in English as compared to perhaps Hindi or any other medium because the community, the student community comes from all over the country. It may be possible in uh, government law colleges or private law colleges, uh, which has, uh, which is only open to not legally, but which practically finds that the student community is from the local area, from the local geography. So language is an issue. 
and uh, it's uh, there are multiple 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 aspects to it which need to be considered one is the challenge uh, which will be faced by a individual vis-a-vis -vis their ability to expand practice if uh, they are studying something in the local language your domain uh, becomes thereby a shortened domain it becomes limited by your inability to correspond or convey in uh, uh, a language especially the language of economics which right now is dominated by english second is that you become unable if you are not able to take it up uh, in the supreme court because the supreme court uh, unfortunately has not used its uh, uh, inherent uh, constitutional powers to have even regional benches or even go for circuit sitting so we have a Supreme Court confined to the New Delhi's uh, um, region, which prevents access and which gives uh, an undue advantage to those uh, uh, people of India who happen to be from the Northern uh, Hindi belt. So these are the, uh, uh, real issues which requires uh, a much more broader approach. Uh, and uh, the Bar Council's uh, current way of thinking, especially of course, it's a government's way, the central government's way of thinking, which tries to promote uh, regional languages in this particular manner may not really be a good thing for the legal profession. So that is something that uh, might be looked into. Then uh, another aspect uh, uh, in relation to uh, opposition for uh, language as a barrier, especially the use of English language uh, or even Hindi for that particular matter is uh, language is the rulers uh, uh, or the what or whatever is the hegemon's uh, area so when you identify your thought process to a foreign language then it gives a natural advantage to those persons who are the native speakers of that language so when we convert our thought processes into something that is alien to us look at how English is fiercely resisted by the Germans and the French and the Arabic for the purpose of, uh, or even the Spanish people, for the purpose of uh, uh, world dominance. So Chinese also. Uh, they, they, whenever the political personalities meet, they try to convey what they want in the language of their native places. This allows for, of course, it allows for some flexibilities with respect to you know, explaining away any problem uh, that might subsequently arise on the translation part of it. But, uh, and that's a diplomatic way of putting it. But there is a serious issue vis-a-vis -vis our ability to converse uh, and our ability to argue uh, with native speakers of a particular language. I'm not saying that uh, uh, Indians are alien to, or there are, we have uh, uh, states in India where English is a mother tongue. So it's, I'm not talking about that regional difference as such, but does it really uh, promote the cause of India if we allow for uh, regional language just to be there, included as uh, 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 for the purpose of legal education? Does it really promote Indian course if we allow for English or Hindi as a uh, medium for instruction for the purpose of legal education? This is an area that is seriously to be looked into. It's a challenge that we are facing. I'm not arguing for any one of these. Uh, from being a basic Malayali, I'll always uh, uh, say that uh, we are better off learning as many languages as is possible. Uh, for our uh, um, career progress. But that is something else. You know, making it part and choosing on the language is a serious uh, challenge that we are going to face immediately. Then uh, there is this other uh, uh, area, the realm of uh, alternative dispute resolution services, whether it is arbitration, mediation, negotiation, the kind of private court systems that are coming up now. Uh, the canonical courts, the Sharia courts, all these are areas uh, where uh, we don't have a proper regulatory framework. So these are uh, uh, not necessarily covered in the legal education, 
the spaces are uh, not necessarily regulated. There is no standards as such, other than that laid down by different uh, uh, stakeholders vis-a-vis -vis their own, uh, protecting their own vested interests. So this is an area which needs to be addressed. Then uh, the, the reason why uh, I was opposing the professional bodies alone becoming uh, the regulators, especially one of the uh, suggestions vis-a-vis -vis the regulation of uh, bar council's own activities is uh, to make bar council more representative of other disciplines, which has not really happened. So when uh, domains uh, remain the exclusive uh, uh, preserves of uh, a particular Western interest, then uh, their ability to impart something that is having an interdisciplinary nature. Legal education is not something that is the domain of only legal professionals. It is something that is touching upon a huge uh, era, area of uh, other disciplines. So this is an area, this is something that uh, our regulatory framework does not squarely address, the interdisciplinary nature of imparting legal education. And I mentioned this earlier, LLB and LLM cannot be the only uh, degrees where uh, uh, law is taught or law ought to be taught. And uh, mm, the social sciences uh, like uh, political science, uh, economics, uh, uh, history, sociology, all these uh, require, and even sciences, uh, both uh, technical as well as uh, the general sciences, uh, especially with the advent of uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence and um, intellectual property regime. These are areas uh, which touch upon uh, their uh, uh, performance also. So these are areas that require a regulator, which is not merely the bar council. And tweaking the bar council by bringing in people from uh, other disciplines may not be the correct or appropriate answer for this kind of a, a situation. That is a regulatory framework. Now I'll just take into account some con the challenges, contemporary challenges, which I've identified. Uh, I'll take some time with respect to each one of these. The first is the consumerist nature of professional legal education. So law colleges and law imparting uh, the LLB uh, uh, degree imparting universities have now uh, become more of teaching shops both, uh, uh, and when I say teaching shops, I'm not uh, saying it uh, in a derogatory manner. It's teaching shop from the perspective of the student who is coming over there. The earlier the concept of teaching shop was where uh, uh, you pay, you get something. And uh, that unfortunately has now really become a, a market dictated issue also. So are we able to cater or should be cater to the market? Courses in the context of legal education. What is it that really should be our uh, objective? Should it be to uh, provide uh, uh, legal education services uh, in the consumer sense of it? Or should it be to provide it uh, uh, from the public goods uh, perspective of it? This is something that uh, we need to uh, have a clear vision about. This is a challenge. This has not been addressed squarely. So, if it is, if if we look at it from the professional perspective, then it is the peers in the profession who train uh, the novices in the profession on the on, on in the entire professional ethics part of it. Uh, and uh, consumerist nature does not uh, look into this this part of uh, legal uh, profession. So this is an area which is not covered squarely by the way. You know, one paper on professional ethics may not be an adequate response to this particular challenge. And that, uh, uh, and of course, the Bar Council has now insisted that it must be the members, adjunct members on the bar who actually teach uh, uh, the, the professional ethics paper, or even for, uh, for that matter, the alternative uh, uh, dispute resolution papers also. Does that really answer the question in relation to the demands? Uh, uh, from the uh, market vis-a-vis -vis what they want from the legal uh, uh, education sector. And I, I raise this uh, issue on account of the fact that there are institutions, even in Kerala, which impart uh, 
legal education through so called evening programs not though they are not strictly evening programs but the classes are conducted uh, uh, in the evenings and an llb degree is awarded which uh, practically does not differ with okay, which legally does not differ from any other llb degree that that same university awards but uh, practically differs because it is offered outside of the 7 am 7 pm window uh, given by the bar council and it is not a recognized bar council degree because the bar council has the, the, the has not certified that institution vis-a-vis -vis that particular uh, course so we have a situation where there are takers for this llb degree and uh, that means that there is a market for that legal knowledge irrespective of the fact that that particular law degree may not enable the person to practice the law as an advocate or practice the law in the way the legal education rules define practicing of law or as practicing the law as supreme court has in its multiple judgments defined what practice is so there is a need that means there is there are people there is a market uh, for learning law in a proper setting, in a proper college environment. And uh, currently, the risk is taken by the universities because there is no standard laid down, there is no regulation laid down vis-a-vis -vis a uniform pattern for offering it. And uh, Bar Council most often ignores this or sometimes threatens to shut these uh, uh, facilities down. Now, I see it as a challenge because uh, when you are imparting legal education and that legal education is meant for a different, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, practice area, then it must be regulated. And if it is not to be regulated by the professional agency, then it must be clearly, specifically laid down that this is beyond the competence of the professional legal body so that uh, this can be actually opened in, in, a, in a way the, you, the, uh, the mandate of each university allows it to. So this arbitrary uh, time periods insisted on by Bar Council is actually something that uh, is a challenge that faces the legal profession. Why should uh, in the in the in the uh, in the era of technology, where uh, lighting adequate lighting is available for twenty four hours, most classrooms in high tech uh, facilities actually use artificial lighting. They they put the pull the curtain over the windows and uh, sh shut out sunlight. If that is the case, why? What is the insistence? What is the meaning for for insisting that legal education can be imparted only from seven a.m. to seven p.m.? This is a problem. Second is that you are creating an infrastructure by way of buildings, classrooms, and you are not able to, as an innovator, as an entrepreneur, you are not able to use it for uh, twenty-four hours. It doesn't make any business sense at all even for the purpose of government. We are a nation which do not really have adequate number of legal professionals. So the vis-a-vis -vis the number of cases. Legal professionals may object to that, saying that there are more number of lawyers than that is uh, uh, required. But it is a fact that uh, legal services ought to be much cheaper than uh, uh, what it is right now. Uh, as compared to the paying capacity of the ordinary Indian. That is one area. So we need more lawyers. Yet we are letting our uh, infrastructure lie idle for one third of the uh, time. There is nothing that prevents, that ought to prevent us from running three shifts with the same infrastructure. Of course, you need uh, more number of teachers, uh, more number of support staff. But the same infrastructure of the buildings can be used. The libraries can be used for this particular purpose. And the way we are approaching it, uh, it's not really something that uh, um, adequately addresses the situation. So we are a poor country 
vis-a-vis -vis the infrastructure that is available. We are a needy country looking at the number of persons who require these services and that our policies do not really facilitate the optimum use of our resources. And, the, uh, and uh, I, I'm just pointing this out on the context that uh, when we were in the 60s, when the Chinese incursion happened, we were able to do multiple shifts in our education institutions, especially on the technical side. So it's not a question that you, a question of uh, uh, lack of implement uh, or uh, impossibility in implementation, just a question of uh, lack of political will to address this particular issue. So it is something that we can do to cater to the consumerist nature of uh, uh, the legal services industry. Then uh, this very real disconnect between the bar and the academia. Every law college is supposed to have a legal aid clinic. And when the time for bar council's inspection comes, one room would be painted, labeled neatly, identifying it as the legal aid clinic. In practice, there are very few institutions, very few law colleges, very few uh, universities even uh, of a national level uh, who actually has a functioning legal aid clinic. And uh, there are two multiple, no, two major reasons for this. And that is a contemporary challenge also. It's, it has been a challenge from for a long time. And, uh, but for very few, very, but there are model uh, law colleges like say, for example, the Salgoka Law College in Goa, which uh, is, is a pioneer with respect to the conduct of legal aid clinics. But uh, other law colleges uh, uh, are not able to cater to this particular aspect of uh, uh, implementation of the rules as such, the legal education rules as such. And Bar Council, uh, though, provided a mandate, a statutory mandate, though they claim a mandate, are not able to ensure that the legal clinics actually work, are functional. Now, a legal aid clinic is supposed to ensure that social responsibility part of a law college in that local uh, geographical arena. And it is an area where a law student can get first-hand experience vis-a-vis -vis the problems that plague our nation. The plight of uh, an, an individual who is not able to afford a proper lawyer. Even the, the, the fact that uh, uh, law uh, or the subjects that are, that, that are uh, under consideration ex expands, you know, it, it extends to much more than what is taught in the law colleges. So the ability to do legal research, the empathy that is required uh, to listen to other person's uh, uh, issues, sifting the legal issue from all other issues, keeping your emotions under control, licensing with lawyers so that uh, the, the, uh, the issue can be taken up before the appropriate legal fora, trying to get remedies to the clients that come before the uh, legal aid clinics. In fact, only functional legal aid clinics, which work under the supervision of faculty who have exposure uh, to the actual practice of law, and of course, which makes it mandatory, not just in theory, but in practice also, mandatory for the law student to be exposed to the uh, to the inconveniences of, or to be taken out from the comfort zones that they find themselves to be in, to be lifted out of the rut and placed in the, in the midst of society. Uh, this is something that uh, uh, will, or is supposed to take care of the gap between the academy and the practice of the profession, and which is actually envisaged under the, the Bar Council's uh, rules for imparting legal education, which, uh, the colleges do not implement, the universities do not implement, the, which the Bar Council is not able to enforce implementation. And uh, this is the, the, the law and the spirit. The, the, the spirit can be achieved uh, or the practical objective can be achieved if the spirit of it is actually absorbed by the institutions. 
and uh, there is a problem uh, vis-a-vis that the legal education sector is concerned. The major problem is that uh, teachers are scared uh, of uh, made uh, uh, party to legal aid clinics, especially those teachers who have absolutely no uh, what do you call uh, and I'm talking it out no, out over here. I know there might be people who might uh, who will have objections. What I'm saying is that if uh, a teacher does not have exposure to the bar, has not actually practiced in the bar, it becomes very difficult for that teacher to uh, man a legal aid clinic unless there is an effort on the part to overcome that particular short, that uh, shortcoming. So it is a it's a question of uh, the management uh, providing the necessary space, uh, not just the physical space as such that is important, but the space within the cur curriculum to, to to enable a teacher to uh, impart this particular uh, duty. Uh, then there is uh, another aspect also, especially in the context of legal aid clinics, which is again a challenge. Uh, if you have classes uh, right from the morning till evening, where is the time to man the clinic? So the the timetables must be set in such a way that uh, this becomes part of the regular job profile and not something that is done after of a, 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 of the regular uh, uh, hours. And now it's uh, both in relation to those persons who want to come over to the uh, institution as well as with respect to the fatigue element built into uh, forcing people to work after not respecting the, the the clear delineation between work and leisure. If that is the way it is going to be pushed by the educational institution, it may not be something that is going to be a, a, a practically useful tool. So building in internship opportunities uh, of, a, of a flexible nature uh, so that uh, the legal aid clinics can also function throughout the time, throughout uh, uh, the time the colleges are open, throughout the uh, uh, the year, uh, even during vacations, uh, it's something that needs to be uh, uh, determined at the level of the institution, and it should be facilitated at the when the syllabuses and the exam periods are settled. Now there is some effort on the part of uh, uh, the Kerala government to provide for a uniform pattern vis-a-vis -vis all the education institutions, especially higher education institutions, providing for vacations at specific uh, time periods, uh, commencement of. Uh, uh, courses at specific time periods, but these are yet to be you know, made uh, uniform. These are not yet put into practice, though it is uh, that attempt has uh, uh, commenced. So that is a challenge, uh, a contemporary challenge that we need to address. It was a challenge earlier also. It is still remaining as a contemporary challenge. Now, another area which uh, a, a, a teacher in the legal field will be facing is this information flood. Now, it's something that is uh, there not just for the legal profession, it is for all education institutions. Uh, but it affects legal education also in a very significant way. I'll try to uh, build on uh, this information flood. Uh, you have uh, uh, you, a legal education institution is facing the challenge of a parallel uh, institution uh, in the form of a WhatsApp university uh, or uh, uh, some some similar social media university. And uh, you have a serious challenge also in the form of uh, instant misinformation being available, made available through the means of uh, Google or other such uh, search engines. So you have a deluge of misinformation, you have fake information, you have uh, uh, reports which uh, masquerade, you know, false reports, which masquerade as genuine ones. So th it's a problem of plenty. And uh, there is a requirement to sift out everything. And for a lawyer, there are, there are problems with respect to this as a law, law teacher also, as a law student also. The genuineness of the source is something that needs to be ascertained. And uh, it becomes a problem when we look into another aspect of it. I have mentioned that subsequently, but I'll just touch upon that now so that it, it makes sense. Most often, the databases that are required for proper research are unavailable because of the cost involved. Say, 
my institution, for example, spends more than 50 lakh per year for the purpose of uh, making available certain databases. And I, as a teacher, I'm not really satisfied with the databases that are available. Okay, I'm not saying that we don't have databases uh, uh, that ought to be there. What I'm saying is that uh, when you teach a, a particular subject, you will find that some of the most specialized subjects uh, access to information is behind paywalls. So it is not enough that an education institution say, has, say, say, for example, what we have is we have Manupatra, we have Hain Online, we have LexisNexis, uh, we have uh, Westlow, we have almost all the databases that a, a regular law school uh, might find difficult in procuring. Uh, but the problem is that, uh, say, I'm teaching marine insurance. I need access to the Lloyd's Law reports. I need access to the uh, database, uh, uh, which hides behind a huge paywall. I have. I may be, may be having access to the case law. I may not have access to the, say, for example, anybody practicing uh, or trying to teach arbitration uh, when in, with an international flavor needs Clover arbitration because that provides that's a that's a very huge database associated with that. So these are costly vis-a-vis -vis the number of students who are going to access it. So it doesn't make any economic sense for each, each university to actually, or each uh, 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 law college to actually subscribe to this. And this creates a, a dependency on Google. So we don't have access to the appropriate information makes us less endowed with respect to our ability to respond to the, the, to the challenges that are thrown up by, thrown up on a daily basis by the legal profession. So information flood is there. Lack of access to information in spite of that flood is also there. So the quality legal databases is something that is a requirement to deal with the problem of information flood. When information flood brings with it all the debris that needs to be sorted out, it, it becomes an impossible task for a young learner, somebody who doesn't have access to the quality uh, legal information, uh, and we cannot blame those persons from relying on misinformation or fake information and then learning on the basis of that. This is a problem. And uh, uh, well, there was this case before the Kerala High Court also in the context of uh, the Kerala Law Times. No, not Law Times. I think it was Kerala Law Journal. No, not Kerala Law Journal. What was it? Uh, forgot the particular journal where they published, uh, the court was relying on a uh, text uh, put out by by the publisher and uh, there was a mistake some some aspects of it some of aspects of the original statute was uh, not available in the publication and there was a case against the publisher and uh, which again highlights the issue where it is not uh, uh, merely the private publishers who uh, create that kind of a havoc, our access to our own uh, government information, government uh, data, in spite of the, uh, the Right to Information Act uh, being there, is a problem because uh, the Gazette publications may not also be really available uh, in, in, a, in a manner that makes it searchable. So if it's only a picture file, then you don't really get, the, get to see the Gazette. Uh, today, when I was... Uh, uh, trying to up upload some of these uh, uh, information that I'm basing uh, my arguments on, uh, I had to find uh, a Gazette notification from a private source because uh, the e-Gazette did not uh, or is not available to my search. So these are all uh, issues vis-a-vis -vis finding the right source of information. Then, uh, and this again, the fourth uh, problem is something that has been universally pointed out. The current generation is supposed to have the uh, an attention span of less than that of a goldfish, which is around uh, eight seconds. 
So it's supposed to be less than that, even less than eight seconds, eight to nine seconds. So the how do we really get the attention of the young generation? I started off saying that I didn't want a lecture, but this is a problem. Our uh, system facilitates lectures. Students also would rather have a lecture uh, where they are, they, they don't they, they don't uh, exercise their uh, brain cells, ask questions, uh, then have a, a Socratic method of teaching where you need to know, read through the material before you come to the class and uh, respond immediately, you know, think uh, before you answer and uh, be uh, given instant uh, karma kind of uh, answers also, you know, instant responses, instant feedback. There is a scare uh, to face that kind of uh, scrutiny. So, both from the part of the teacher as well as probably from the part of the students, uh, the attention span is not something that has been addressed. And this is not uh, confined to legal education. Well, in the context of legal education, what is uh, a problem is that uh, you are bringing real life problems to a set of individuals who have been taught and pampered uh, to understand that uh, uh, any emotional issue, anything that puts pressure on them can be ignored, uh, can be addressed, can be tackled at a later point in time. No, you push it away without taking a decision. That is That seems to be a, uh, the kind of message that uh, the school education system is now providing. And we are, we are tackling that. We are also in the same uh, uh, context. And the current methodologies for teaching, I don't know, uh, some of the uh, some of these aspects have been addressed already by other teachers, other uh, resource persons who have mentioned it earlier. The pedagogy, uh, if it's a five-year program, it is supposed to be pedagogy in the first year and then andragogy because you are now going to deal with adults. In the context of a three-year program, it is andragogy. But we always know if you look at it, all the uh, all the uh, FDPs that we have, it is always, always uh, focused on pedagogy. So alternative methods, especially catering to the needs of adults, especially young adults, is, is not part of our uh, uh, teaching methodology. So that is another area uh, because uh, the UGC norms, which are followed, the minimum standards, they envisage 16 hours of teaching, 16 hours of teaching. But uh, that teaching gets translated into as just lectures most often in the colleges where the actual teaching process happens. Then another another area that I found to be of significant uh, uh, problem is the semester system. Semester system, practically the teaching happens uh, over a period of three to four months per semester. A little over three months, a little less than four months is what uh, is usually available. Now, for an honors program, it is supposed to be 18 weeks of teaching. And I, I, I find that uh, across institutions, the maximum that uh, is available is around uh, 15 to 16 weeks. Uh, given the fact that a lot of other activities, student-related activities, will also have to be packed into the semester. Now, there are two issues with respect to that. One is that the syllabus is vast. We need to break down the syllabus. We need to break down the subjects that were earlier taught as part of a one-year program into something that can be actually assimilated, taught and assimilated in a shorter time period. But that has not necessarily happened. Second is that some of the subjects require a, a period of contemplation. I learn something, I need to ruminate on that. I need to chew on that subject. I need to understand the various nuances of it over a period of time before I'm tested. What now happens is that the semester is over. The entire thing is that whatever is taught, the six subjects that are taught is wiped away from the mind. And then a fresh set is pushed in. So this semester system of teaching is really not conducive for legal education is what I think is a challenge. But of course, uh, people, uh, uh, others uh, will have their own opinions. Uh, 
I, I, I think this is a problem, but uh, it's, it requires, it can be addressed. It's not that it cannot be addressed, but there are some subjects which require a longer period of uh, uh, what do you call uh, constant interaction before it becomes something that is really appreciated. Say, for example, constitutional law. I don't think constitutional law is something that can really be understood in two semesters, even if you break it down into constitution one and constitution two. And uh, there has to be an ecosystem for uh, appreciating a particular subject. You need to cover the basics first before you can build on it. And uh, when I see people who have studied contract law with uh, very less confidence, with le very less ability, trying to study other commercial subjects, every other commercial subject is dependent upon your thorough understanding of contractual law principles, basic principles of contract. And they suffer. So it's not easy. Then uh, we have uh, uh, a major uh, problem. There is a lack of textbooks which discusses legal principles with an Indian bias. We have a, a system that is transplanted into India, but we have a people who think as Indians. So there is a real disconnect between uh, this particular, the availability of textbooks and uh, an availability of, uh, uh, of material on which arguments can be built, which is, which, which reflects the Indian way of thinking. And when I say Indian way, it's a pan-Indian uh, kind of a thing. It can be, you know, when you, when it, when it is uh, boiled down into regional context, probably we need, say for example, land laws. Land laws are all state specific. There are some, say, for, in the context of acquisition, yes, there is a national one, but there are legislations which are state specific. So, how how is it going to be taught? Bar Council uh, uh, may not be the appropriate body uh, if it is a Bar Council of India uh, to deal with it. And of course, if, uh, one must also understand that legal education is in the concurrent list. So the states can also know there are state specific legislations which may not be taught in law colleges, which is a requirement, but uh, which is uh, something that a lawyer, a trained legal professional must be able to study at leisure in a law college from experts who are practitioners in order to really make use of it when they come before the court. So that is another. The costly legal text the current uh, legal thinking or the current uh, uh, thinking in the higher education sector, which is not uh, uh, really in favor of uh, promoting Indian public publishers, is something that we need to revisit. The scopus, the insistence on scopus listing and care processes by the UGC, where it's a foreign uh, publisher monopoly, does not and, and uh, giving an incentive to a, a legal uh, profession or even any, any, any academic to publish in, uh, with foreign publishers uh, is not something that really promotes an Indian agenda. It does not promote Indian interests at all. It just promotes uh, some foreign publishers. And you will find that uh, most of the earlier uh, active uh, Indian publishing houses have now become uh, you know, subsidiaries of foreign publishers. So you are uh, pushing the country, UGC as well as uh, the uh, the current uh, legal framework, it pushes the country into the hands of uh, foreign uh, foreigners at large. And of course, on the other side, you have Indians, uh, uh, Indian entrepreneurs or enterprising Indians uh, uh, looking this as a loophole and uh, creating their foreign publishing houses in Bangladesh or establishing it in Bangladesh or Nepal and uh, Sri Lanka to attract that kind of a thing, which does not really address the issue of quality. So on one side, quality Indian publications it need to be promoted. Second, uh, we need to actively encourage Indians in publishing under the Indian uh, uh, with Indian publishers, and we need to incentivize uh, uh, the quality to be improved vis a vis the Indian publishers. So these are all areas that requires uh, these are challenges that needs to be addressed. Then, a major problem: UGC's expectations of research output whether it is empirical or doctrinal, when a, a faculty member is asked to 
uh, spend uh, a minimum of 16 hours. And if it is a private institution, you will find that uh, uh, I had a, uh, a, a, an exposure to a teacher who was uh, saying that in his private institution, 35 hours per week was what he was uh, pushing. Uh, not pushing, he was forced to. So on one side, there is a professional demand from the UGC as an academic uh, regulator. Uh, saying that you need to spend so much of hours in classroom teaching. And on the other side, uh, there is an insistence on research. Now, research uh, publication, it, it, it's something that you cannot expect every law faculty to be a researcher as well as a teacher. You can be a researcher focusing on research and in certain specific institutions which facilitates that, especially probably in the context of, uh, say, uh, research comes from you know, at a particular stage. So you, if you have a LLB class, uh, multiple LLB classes to attend to and then do research, it may not be really possible. But if you have, say, LLM classes, then from LLM to research is much more easier. So probably universities must be the focal areas for research and uh, insistence uh, for following that. Of course, there is some dilution from the original envisaged rules, which are the research outputs that is expected. But the fact that it was originally proposed itself shows the disconnect between the UGC as a uh, standard setting body in relation to vis-a-vis -vis the um, uh, legal education also. Uh, and of course, Bar Council has completely practitioners which want the practitioners to uh, go into the classes, but which prevents a, a teacher from uh, uh, practicing. That kind of a disconnect is there. So the research part of it, there is problems over here. These are real challenges which requires to be addressed by uh, at, at a professional level. This require, these are required to be addressed. And uh, the workload pattern, this needs to be really revisited. And uh, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, this particular aspect, uh, then the uh, point number nine also comes in. The teaching methodology, it does not uh, encourage creation of litigation lawyers because the exposure vis-a-vis -vis the litigation craft or advocacy craft uh, in the law, law courts is very, um, it's, it's not given the proper trust that it ought to be. And even when theoretically we say that it must be done, the actual classroom environment and uh, the syllabus structures may not really in, you know, enable it. These are, these are areas that requires to be revisited, uh, redrafted uh, and uh, fresh policies uh, uh, to be applied. Then uh, the traditional examination system. Of course, UGC only speaks about evaluation, but evaluation, but the kind of standards that are expected and the standardization that has happened, the evaluation process, so long as it does not uh, um, trust the teachers, is something that uh, cannot, or the students, it is something that uh, uh, cannot be. And of course, there is abuse on the side of both the students as well as teachers which uh, uh, creates that distrust. So it cannot be uh, originally, or it, it cannot be done in such a way where uh, the teacher who is teaching is able to actually assess and evaluate uh, through whatever is the method that uh, uh, they want to. All, only what is required is that that must be properly documented. But uh, what we write current, uh, currently, what we practice is a, a an examination system where it's all learned by rote and uh, um, pack it all into one day's uh, assessment process. So that is something that uh, we really need to revisit. The examination system, the traditional method of uh, examination as the chosen evaluation uh, uh, system is something that we need to practically chuck. But for that, we need to create a system where there is proper documentation on one side, documentation in a, in, in a sense that will not take away more time than what is required. Optimum time, proper documentation, proper evaluation, which really places trust on both the student as well as on the teacher for bringing out the, the, the input that is required. Then there is this uh, complexity. So my point number 11 is there are too many statutes. Law has grown in complexity. This is what uh, the Bar Council also has identified. And uh, the current uh, LLB framework only facilitates creating a generalist. And we need uh, uh, supplementing, we need to supplement uh, 
the LLB program with uh, value added uh, courses. Separate from the LLB program, which is intended to create uh, specialists and super specialists in areas which are not traditionally taught. And for that, we need equipped persons. We, 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 we need no, we need to create uh, that kind of uh, uh, personnel. And of course, uh, education institutions must also facilitate the movement of such persons. They need not be advocates. They need not be law graduates. They need not hold an LLM. They need not have a net qualification, but they may be an expert in a particular field of specialization, which is important because law is an interdisciplinary study. Currently, it is not facilitated. And this is uh, uh, felt, This the adverse effect of it is felt by the student community. Then the last point that I have in the context of contemporary challenges is the impact of generative artificial intelligence in the legal education sphere. Chat GPT and BARD are only the, you know, the, the harbingers of radical changes that are going to happen. There is nothing that prevents, that ought to prevent uh, uh, a, a law student or a law teacher from relying on generative AI for uh, legal education purposes. If we are trying to keep it away, away from the classrooms, then we are shutting down an opportunity for our uh, law students. The, 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 the trick is to handle it in such a way that we are able to harness the use of generative AI without it affecting the quality of education that we impart. Encourage the students to use it. Point out the pitfalls. Discuss the papers that are generated. Generate it multiple times to see what exactly is the kernel that is uh, that, that uh, uh, or the crux, the, the idea that is the seed of that particular paper. And then point out what human elements can bring in, which even now the generative AI has not been able to replace with. That is how we keep you know, the, the, the need uh, for human element in legal education intact. And that is you know, it's something that uh, uh, is required to, uh, to bring in the human element with respect to, because these are all uh, social sciences. The society is a necessity. It cannot be completely converted into a mechanical kind of a thing. Now, uh, uh, two other uh, aspects are uh, uh, the academic freedom. This is a uh, relatively new kind of a, uh, area where uh, first one, point number 13 in relation to academic freedom is with respect to the teaching uh, shop, the affiliated uh, system where the university sets the syllabus which, which offers no flexibility uh, to the or the regulator sets it and there is no flexibility to the uh, the teaching shop. Uh, so that is the, the part of teaching shop that I was mentioning earlier. The second uh, academic freedom is in relation to and the, the 13, point number 13 can be addressed if we have more number of value added courses where the complete freedom is given to the, the faculty to frame the course and uh, impart it so that uh, it is it supplements and it encourages uh, looking into other uh, non-traditional subject areas. It can be self-financing uh, uh, subject areas also. It, it, it acts as an incentive for the colleges to offer that kind of a thing. Catering only to a very few select set of people, select set of students. It need not be the LLB community alone. It can bring in people from outsiders, from the, the other professionals, from other fields who want to study that particular area but provide it within the law colleges so that it enhances the ability of the law college to cater to the needs, the market needs of the student community. It can be offered in, on Saturdays and Sundays, but the current uh, regulatory framework must facilitate that. It should not, no, it should not put to task the legal education, a uh, law college uh, that provides that kind of a service saying that it, uh, it, it, the, the university should not threaten it with a disaffiliation. That is what I'm talking about. So that academic freedom is severely compromised right now. It needs to be brought in. The second is the lack of uh, space in academia right now vis-a-vis -vis alternative thinking. So political philosophy, political ideology is, and uh, identification in the social media with uh, uh, intolerance uh, has vitiated the atmosphere for academic discussions in the classrooms. And law being a social science, all kinds of arguments must be encouraged in the classrooms. And uh, academic discussion must be made rich. 
uh, without labels, without political ideology, interfering in such discussion. And this is a major challenge that, uh, uh, and teachers prefer to play it safe, you no, know, without taking any position. So that is something that we need to uh, really, I'm not saying that teachers should not take any position. What I'm saying is that even if teachers have a position in their private life, it should not intervene or it should not uh, uh, be a interference either from the part of the student or from the management or from the part of other teachers which have been discussing these things in the academic uh, uh, sessions in the classrooms. And this is a seriously compromised area at the moment. Then uh, the lack of appreciation of the interdisciplinary nature of legal profession with our emphasis on law. There's inadequate emphasis on the other social sciences or even in the context of uh, uh, natural sciences or technology. Now, we don't have adequate uh, uh, personnel in the law colleges to address these issues. And this is something that the managements can, uh, it's not economically viable at the moment. They need to think about you know, new methods to make it uh, economically viable. Perhaps having affiliations with local industry to support the, the movement of personnel from the industry into the academia for say a week or a month or a term so that uh, uh, these kinds of value enhancement and value additions to legal education can take place. So these are the contemporary challenges that I'm finding. But the solutions, of course, it, these are reforms. So a radical approach, a reformative outlook towards legal education is required. We must keep the larger national interests in mind because we require a, a pool of talented lawyers. India as a nation requires a pool of talented lawyers. It will keep uh, our economy uh, vibrant. It will reduce uh, uh, certain uh, costs associated with uh, dispute resolution as such. Then uh, legal education, it must be brought out from the silos of education institutions. You know, legal aid clinics must be more uh, society oriented. It should come out of the education institution. It must happen in the midst of society for this to actually uh, happen. And the, the mobility of an uh, uh, academic, uh, somebody who is a regular teacher must also be allowed to do some aspects of the profession. And the Bar Council's insistence that it must be uh, prevented is something that does not gel, really gel well with me. Of course, the Central Bar Council rules allow for uh, up to three hours, uh, uh, say, what they say is that 15 hours in a week can be uh, taught by a, a teacher, but the essence, the, the spirit of it was lost uh, sometime back when they, when the Bar Council, uh, especially in Kerala, it, it, it sent a, uh, uh, a, a letter asking for all full-time faculty to mandatorily uh, suspend their practice. When the Bar Council rules, the Central Bar Council rules does not really envisage that, provided your number of teaching hours is less than, or is uh, not more than 15. But the UGC, you know, if the, when the UGC uh, norms insist on 16 hours of teaching, then obviously, unless it is a 16 hour week, it becomes a difficulty. So if it is 16 hours, you can have uh, up to three hours not exceeding three hours is what the bar council says. So these are things that can be tweaked in such a way that a practitioner can actually be in the classroom and a person who is a teacher can actually be there in the courtroom. This is what is required. Then uh, the third uh, uh, point, the lack of basic minimum uh, human infrastructure. If teachers are not paid well, you know, education is, uh, educational qualification must be insisted on. But after insisting on an educational qualification, if the teachers are not adequately paid, then the best talents will keep out of the profession. So this is something that needs to be really addressed. And uh, for legal education, it is not enough for the Bar Council to conduct periodic inspections. But uh, inspection, you know, most often, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, treated with the importance that it actually deserves. Most often, it... Uh, is alleged to be a corrupt activity. And it's something that uh, uh, it, uh, it really makes it uh, uh, painful because right under the nose of the Bar Council, if teachers are paid a pittance, especially in the private, uh, uh, the mushrooming private law institutions in the country, it, it does not uh, uh, behave well of either the regulator or the uh, uh, institutions. So that is a major problem and it requires to be addressed. And uh, a, a dissatisfied or a non-qualified teacher uh, in the classroom uh, is not going to in any way contribute towards uh, improved, improving the quality of legal education. Then the 
pedagogy must take into account the needs of the current generation of learners. Each generation, uh, the Bloom's taxonomy provides some basic and idea, understanding, but uh, how relevant it is to the current uh, uh, generation is something that uh, needs to be revisited. And uh, we, we need to, as a community, we need to uh, pay serious attention to that. Uh, one of the solutions that I would uh, uh, suggest with vis vis the high cost is that uh, if institutions in the neighborhood pool their resources and facilitate access to those resources, with, uh, you know, that can only happen if the librarians uh, have uh, quality and uh, library resources are uh, uh, paid uh, adequate uh, attention to, then there is a possibility that uh, collectively uh, better negotiations can happen between institutions with uh, the owners of these databases and uh, access to uh, quality information, uh, legal information, legal materials can be made available to the students. Then, I'm really glad, you no, know, an international FDP of this kind on a regular basis by a private institution. These are things that uh, are the need of the hour. And there must be some, uh, the, the uh, 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 timing of it is important. Encouragement given to the teacher to, uh, to participate in such programs is also important. Facilitating that by the management is important. Incentives for uh, uh, doing these programs must is also important. These are all practically possible. And the better institutions in the country actually does that. They send their faculty, they send their students outside fully funded programs because they have collaboration with outside universities and they have funding for the same. So it, it's a question of attitude. It's not that it's not possible. It's a question of attitude and a political will uh, at the part of the institutional level for the for the for this to happen. And then a proper appreciation of the fact that the teaching is a lifelong learning experience. So a good teacher must always be willing to learn every day, every second, and even from the students. So uh, I really don't like uh, it when teachers ask the students to shut down their laptops or their mobile devices in the classrooms. Uh, but we must you know, in a, be in a position to encourage them to actually use it for the purpose of that learning process in the class itself. So shutting it down and uh, being the sole provider of information may not be an appropriate way for a teacher of the current uh, of the new generation students. So that is something that uh, uh, you know, learn and encourage them to search, find better materials, better alternatives, better so that the uh, discussions in the classrooms becomes much more uh, 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 enriching. So these are some of the materials that I have uh, gone through for the purpose of uh, this uh, uh, session. Uh, I leave the PPT for the uh, participants with the organizers. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, uh, dear participants, if you have any doubts, please ask. Not just questions, you no, know, if you want to make a statement or uh, contribute towards uh, the session, you know, understanding the legal challenges, please go ahead. Uh, so I think everything is clear, sir. Now, I'll tell you, Jenny, this okay. is the problem with respect to our classes also, no? We yes. are all teachers. Most of us are teachers. Most of us are in the legal profession. If we don't have any doubts. That just means that I know my limitations. So I know what uh, the quality of uh, the uh, lecture I have delivered. So if there is no doubt, that means that nobody is really listening or nobody really wants to show up their face over here. That is it. That's nothing else. <laughs> I think everything is clear, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank so you we can wind up the session. Okay. Thank you so much, sir, for such an enlightening session. Thank you for sharing your valuable experience and knowledge with us. Uh, we are so thankful and so fortunate to have such a session with you. And uh, after all, I also thank all the participants, coordinators, and all the persons who are behind this screen. Thank you so much, everyone.
Yeah, thank you very much. Somebody has stated that they were listening. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Zarao.